Welcome to today's PLMA Load Management Dialogue. We are excited to provide you with practitioner perspectives on flexible energy load management, demand response, distributed energy resources, and managed charging. In today's webinar, we have a special treat in store for you. First of all, PLMA's awards co-chair, Meg Campbell of Guidehouse, will be speaking uh, today as our moderator, and will be joined by the Ontario IESO, led by Mary Bernard. Mary will be joined by colleagues from three of her partner organization and organizations, and these include Sanjay Pai of Energy Hub, Christina Kielty of Ecobee, and Vince Faherty of Google Nest. And given this is a really interesting, exciting, award-winning presentation, we are really uh, looking forward to getting the conversation underway. So I will pass the floor to Meg, and we will get started. Welcome, everybody. Thank you, Judy. I'm very excited to moderate the discussion today. Um, as Judy mentioned, today we'll be talking about Ontario IESO Save on Energy Peak Perks Program, which was awarded a PLMA Program Paysetter Award. So before we dive in, I want to provide a brief description about the PLMA Awards process and the Program Paysetter Award itself. So PLMA offers three primary award categories and presents awards at each spring conference, which is held in May. The awards committee, as well as a group of volunteers, reviews the award submissions with a rubric and scores them. We also go through a review process to discuss rankings before we officially present those to the PLMA board and actually announce the award winners. So today, we're happy to present uh, and dive into the program that won a Program Pace Setter Award. And just again, to give a little bit of background about the Program Pace Setter Award here, it is meant to recognize programs that support and deliver flexible load management. It's really acknowledge innovative solutions and unique program designs and delivery that are paving the way to effectively manage load. So today we'll dive in to hear more about the Save on Energy Perks Peak program, which was awarded for showing huge success in rapid program growth, optimizing enrollment pages, and also utilizing strategic marketing tactics to help ramp up this program. So um, we'll learn more about that. And I wanna just say a, a friendly reminder that as we go throughout today's presentation, um, we certainly want it to be an open conversation and dialogue. So please feel free to put any questions you have throughout the discussion in the chat, and we'll be sure to answer those at the end of this session in Q&A. So with that, I'll pass it off to Mary to kick off the discussion. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Meg, and welcome. Thank you for taking the time to come and hear about our Save on Energy Peak Perks program. My name is Mary Bernard, and I'm the Supervisor of Residential Program Performance at the Independent Electricity System Operator in Ontario, or IESO. I lead a team that is responsible for managing peak perks, as well as other programs in our energy efficiency portfolio that we call local initiatives. These are offers that are available only in certain areas of the province where there are identified electricity needs. So I thought I would begin with a short introduction on what the IESO is and what we do. So as the system operator in Ontario, the IESO operates the grid 24-7 ensuring Ontario receives reliable and cost-effective power when and where it's needed. We also work with our sector partners and engage with communities across Ontario to plan and prepare for the province's electricity needs now and into the future. And through Save on Energy, the ISO offers programs and incentives to help individuals, use, uh, individuals and businesses use energy wisely. So Save on Energy is the mark of energy efficiency programs offered by the IESO. It's been in market since 2011, and it has supported homes and businesses in all sectors across Ontario, helping them better manage their electricity use and their costs. Save on Energy also raises awareness about the many ways we can reduce energy waste in our day-to-day -day lives, putting energy efficiency within everyone's reach. 
So thanks to these efforts, we estimate that Ontario's provincial electricity uh, demand is about 15% lower today than it would be otherwise. So what is Peak Perks? Uh, here's a quick overview of the program itself. The Save on Energy Peak Perks program is our residential demand response offering. Residential electricity customers in Ontario with central air conditioning or a heat pump controlled by a smart thermostat are eligible to take part. Participants help the grid by participating in time limited thermostat adjustments of up to one up to two, sorry up to two degrees Celsius during periods of peak electricity demand. These will occur on weekday afternoons or in early evenings, not on the weekends. Customers are always in control and can opt out of an event at any time. Payments of the incentives are not contingent on participating in the thermostat adjustment events. Events can occur up to 10 times between June 1st and September 30th. Prior to an event, participating thermostats may be adjusted down slightly to pre-cool the home to improve comfort. In exchange for enabling us to adjust their thermostats, participants receive a $75 virtual prepaid MasterCard when they enroll in Peak Perks. They will also receive a $20 virtual prepaid MasterCard each additional year they stay enrolled in the program. And eligible smart thermostats include Ecobee, Google Nest, Emerson or Sensi, Honey, Honeywell Home, and Alarm.com models. So next slide, please. As you can see from the graph, we have experienced a remarkable growth curve. So we launched the program on June 30th, 2023. In January of 2024, we reached 100,000 devices enrolled. And as of today, September 12th, we are at 149,000 devices. So next slide, please. So how did we get here? Um, in Ontario, after over a decade of being flush in capacity and energy, the ISO had projected in its 2021 annual planning outlook that there would be a need for additional electricity capacity beginning next year in 2025. So new energy efficiency programs were identified as part of the actions to be taken to ensure system reliability. And the Ontario government made additional investments in energy efficiency and demand management available in 2022. So the Save on Energy Peak Perks program is a key part of that expansion of energy efficiency programs to support grid reliability. In addition, we happen to have a high penetration of smart thermostats in Ontario. Currently, we estimate that to be about 850,000, but that number is increasing all the time and it's a bit dated, so we're probably higher than that now anyway. One of the reasons why that number is so high is a program called Green On, which the ISO delivered between the fall of 2017 and the second half of 2018. Those of you from Ontario may remember this program. More than 100,000 smart thermostats were provided and installed free of charge for Ontario residents under Green On. And Christina will talk a little bit more about that later on. There was also a readiness of Ontario customers for a residential mass market program. Save on Energy had not had a widespread residential offering in market for several years. A previous residential demand response program called Peak Saver and then later Peak Saver Plus had ended in 2017 and it had involved a site visit to a customer's home to install a load control device. Peak Perks takes advantage of the interest previously shown in these programs but with smart thermostats. And lastly, the Ontario Minister of Energy held a media event about a month before the program launched in 2023, which really helped to prime the pump of interest in the program. People could add their name to a waiting list, which we then used to directly market the program once it was available. So next slide, please. <clears throat> Excuse me. We truly believe that we couldn't have been able to achieve this level of success without the collaboration of the partners shown here. 
So Energy Hub was chosen at the completion of a competitive procurement as a service provider for our program. And we understand that Peak Perks is the fastest growing flexibility program in Energy Hub's decade plus of working with over 60 utility or electricity provider clients. The partners worked together to secure maximum impressions for the program in smart thermostat manufacturer channels, to optimize enrollment pages, and to share marketing recommendations and best practices. And in addition to the partners shown here, Enercare and Reliance Home Comfort, both leading HVAC and home services companies in Ontario, have introduced matching programs for their eligible customers who are also Peak Perks participants. Uh, next slide, please. So marketing is also a key element of the Peak Perks success story. In addition to marketing efforts undertaken by our smart thermostat manufacturer partners, the IESO through its Save on Energy brand used a multi-channel digital marketing campaign to generate awareness of the program, how it works and the benefits to participating. These efforts drove customers to visit the Save on Energy and Peak Perks websites to start their enrollment journey. So we use several digital channels to promote Peak Perks, including using sponsored ads on Meta, X, YouTube, Spotify, Google Search, Demand Gen, and Performance Max. We also use Save on Energy owned channels, including our residential newsletter called Powering What's Next, as well as regular emails to more than 45,000 residential subscribers. About 15% of the total impressions generated through all Save on Energy marketing activity in 2023 was a result of Peak Perks advertisements, which helped to propel the Peak Perks program webpage to be the most visited on the Save on Energy website last year with more than 200,000 visits. And that was only available for six months of the year. So a big congratulations is due to our ISO marketing team, our agency Context Creative, and our OEM partners for their marketing efforts. So with that, I will pass it over to Christina. Awesome, thank you, Mary. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me all right. Um, I'm Christina Kelty. I'm with the Ecobee team, uh, one of the OEMs that was part of the Peak Perks program. I'm one of the senior customer success managers um, supporting our Ontario and Canadian uh, markets within our utility programs. So I was really excited to be a part of this program from, from launch up until now. It's been, a, as you can hear from Mary's presentation, a really exciting program to be a part of. So to kick it off from the Ecobee side, I just want to kind of walk you through what our marketing campaign looked like at a glance. I think Mary's alluded to some of the huge success we've seen and, and the reliance we had on the marketing efforts. Um, so being a Canadian founded company, uh, we were really excited to see a program um, of this size uh, in our own backyard. Um, we hadn't had a Canadian program of this size um, to date, so we were thrilled um, to partner up with the ISO. Um, as Mary mentioned, uh, Ontario is a very unique landscape. I think a big part of um, the growth of this program, we have to speak to the Green On programs that Mary mentioned. Um, in 2017, 2018, we've estimated about 100,000 free thermostats were in installed at no cost to Ontario residents. Um, at the time, there was no demand response program. So we knew as this program was getting off the ground, that those 100,000 homes would be a great uh, target to build some of our marketing around and, and to reach back out to those engaged customers that we knew had an interest in not only smart thermostats, but um, you know, the energy space within Ontario. Um, in the spring of 2023, when the program was getting off the ground, um, Ecobee was thrilled to host the in-person program launch um, where we had the ISO and the Ministry of Energy um, into our downtown head office um, in Toronto, Ontario. And we were able to do this in-person um, launch, created a lot of excitement. We had um, ourselves, other OEMs um, in attendance. And I think that event really created a bit of buzz uh, around the program and, and drove kind of the interest over the next month while we maintain the waitlist um, and, and help to grow 
interest uh, and strong um, growth for the program right off the bat. So from there, we jumped into summer of 2023. The program opened um, at the end of June, as Mary mentioned, um, and our Ecobee marketing team followed uh, this launch up with a press release and a marketing campaign of our own where we launched um, some new in-app prompts that we called drawers, which I'm going to speak to uh, as we go along here, which is a huge success for us. So we really wanted to um, test out some new marketing um, materials and really kickstart uh, the growth uh, with the ISO program. So moving to the next side, please. All right, so this, um, I'm showing a couple images of our um, mobile in-app prompts. Um, so as I said, we released this last summer um, and these in-app prompts, we call them drawers. So what this looks like is when a customer um, would log into their app for the first time or set up a new device in Ontario, when they went through the first run process um, and everything was set up, they would get this pop-up from the bottom of their screen that would walk them through um, the offer, how to sign up, and in, and in about three clicks, they were able to register for the program, which is really simple, really straightforward. Um, a big goal of ours was to move away from some of the reliance on email and meet the customer where they're at. So we know at Ecobee, we see about 90% of our users are active on their app daily. Most of our users are accessing it uh, one to two times per day. So knowing that our customers are already in app, knowing that they're engaging with the Ecobee app, they're interested in, in what's there and controlling um, their device uh, from their smartphone, we wanted to move our marketing into this space. Uh, following the launch, um, we saw some really great results. So we saw a conversion rate of about 19% with our drawers, and this drove about 12% of the enrollment numbers in the first month following the launch. And to date, we're estimating about 30% of our Ecobee Peak Perks applicants are as a result of these drawer um, prompts. So from our perspective, a really big success um, and something we've been able to roll out at a larger scale since then. Uh, next slide, please. Perfect, so to wrap it up from the Ecobee side, really what made the Peak Perks program one of our fastest and largest growing programs to date? Um, a lot of what Mary said, I think a big piece was having engaged Ontario customers. Um, going back to the Green On programs, we had a high volume of devices in the territory. We also had engaged and primed customers that had an interest in um, the future of the Ontario energy space, um, which really helped us to grow quickly with a lot of educated um, invested customers. I think the other piece for us was the in-app marketing. I think that paired with the strong and active ongoing media presence, which continues into the second year of the program. Um, as Mary alluded to, the marketing has been very strong across a number of platforms. And for us, that paired up with our in-app marketing has really grown a lot of trust in our Ecobee customers that this is a great program to be a part of, a great opportunity um, to support their grid and um, take advantage of the strong incentives. Um, and again, for as most of us know, for for our customers having both, you know, their um, OEM in our case, Ecobee device supporting the program, and then a marketing presence in other aspects of their life, um, giving them a lot of confidence that the program was a strong option for them. So, um, again, from our perspective, a huge program, fastest growing program we've had, um, and that thanks to you know engaged customers and a great marketing presence um, showed a lot of success. So that wraps up me. I will pass off to Vince to continue us on. Thanks, Christina. Hey, everybody. My name is Vince Faraday. I'm the Vice President of VPP Growth at Renew Home. Uh, Renew Home is the recent spin out of the Nest Energy and Virtual Power Plant business. Um, but for today, I'm representing Google Nest uh, and on this case study and all this great work that we did with our partners, everybody assembled on this on this call. Uh, I just want to also thank PLMA for this recognition and also for helping to shine a light on this really important case study. I think it's one that represents a new high watermark in our industry of what's possible when when companies like ours come together and engage customers. Uh, and so I, I appreciate the opportunity to help tell this story. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about what we did on the Google Nest side and how we um, helped to participate in this in this in this partnership. And then also add some reflections on what I think is unique about this this program and some takeaways. Um, what we did from the Nest side over the last couple of years, uh, we reached out to hundreds of thousands of Nest customers uh, engaged in the app uh, and then also via email. 
Um, we reach out to customers uh, periodically, invite them to enroll in demand response programs in both in both mediums. And then anytime a new, a new customer buys and installs a Nest thermostat within a couple of days, uh, their surfaced uh, invitation to enroll in a program like Peak Perks, uh, if it's available in their in their region. And we see a, a ton of, of interest that drives through these um, both in-app uh, and in email channels. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. And I just want, also want to reemphasize, I think Christina said this and Mary did as well, the power of, of partnerships and, and reaching all the way back to the Green On program. Um, we really stood on the shoulders together of this great initiative that, as we heard, really started from, from the very top within, within the provincial government in Ontario. Uh, and I think that was incredibly important for how we were able to build such a large resource in such a quick period of time because there were so many thermostats that had been uh, purchased uh, over the Green On program a couple of years ago. And I was with Nest at the time, I remember this well, I know a bunch of us do. There was so much interest in this program when it first started that I think the e-commerce site crashed in the first, the first day or so because there was hundreds of thousands of customers had tried to take advantage of this amazing offer. So um, if you can click the next slide. I think that really comes to the, the keys to success here, and it really anchors first and foremost in that bringing a compelling customer offer. So that free smart thermostat plus the ongoing performance incentive that's made possible by, by Green On and ISO is incredibly important as a foundation for how we see this program having been so successful. Secondly, I really want to call attention to this all of the above marketing approach that that ISO led here. It really it represents significantly more marketing that we than we see in a lot of other places around North America. Uh, and full credit to ISO's marketing team and their leadership here and their investment in this recognition that we need to to really continually market to customers and to uh, and, and to and to call awareness to these these amazing offers. Um, that really is at the, the nexus of the partnerships made possible by ISO, by Energy Hub, and by by OEM. Like, like us. And then the third piece I want to take you to take away from if, if you're a program manager or, or somebody who thinks about growing demand response in, in other utilities, what I think this really comes down to this case study is just good old fashioned go to market hustle. Uh, and by that, I mean a really sustained multi channel, multi year effort that continues through today. Uh, once again, there's, there's a tremendous amount of marketing that is continuously landed among customers, it's, it, this is much more than just checking a box. It's not a one and done assumption of, of you send one email and you think that the program's done. This is, this is good old fashioned hustle, a lot, a, a lot of sustained effort that I think is, has certainly borne fruit uh, and, and full credit to everybody around this call who helped make that possible. That's it for me. I'm gonna hand it to Sanjay, who is gonna run through the, the latest numbers and results from this year. Thank you, Vince. Uh, my name is Sanjay Pai, I'm of the Energy Hub account team. Um, so we are the uh, derms that we or we provide a derm to so the IESO that gives them the ability to control this resource. Um, and to date for the summer of 2024, there's been eight event days called um, so, and we've seen some pretty incredible results so far. So what we're showing here on the screen is a event we called on June 20th this past summer, which had an average total load shed of about 157 megawatts. So a key part of driving this program forward has been maintaining speed and accuracy and event result event results reporting, especially at this scale. So by proving out the reliability of this resource, we're opening the doors for deeper partnerships with control room operators and distribution system operators um, and, you know, getting meaningful results in the control room. So um, I will I will pass it off to the PLMA staff. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I think I was on mute there. <laughs> With that, we'll open it up to Q&A um, and first start off with some questions initially about the enrollment process. Um, so one question from the chat here um, was, is the customer's utility account number required during the enrollment process? So I'll take that one, Meg. Um, the utility account number is not required. The ISO is not a utility, um, so we don't have access to that information and we don't require that information for the administration of the program. So the answer is no. Thanks, Mary. And coupled with that, when showing some of the enrollment information, we also had a question about the number of devices compared to the number of households. Could you share how that compares to the enrollment information? 
Sure. So we allow up to three devices per home to be enrolled in the program. So the number of devices correlates pretty closely with the number of homes. We don't have a lot of homes with two or three devices. So when we said we reached 100,000 devices in January, that was earlier in January, but later in the month, we also reached 100,000 homes. So they're pretty close. Thank you. All right. And as part of the program, you guys mentioned, again, some of the marketing messages, the incentive offered to customers to enroll in the program. Um, could you shed some light on how you decided to provide uh, MasterCard incentives instead of a bill credit? Um, well, again, it goes back to the fact that the ISO is offering the program and the ISO is not the utility. So we didn't have the ability to offer bill credits. So we went with the MasterCard and it seems to have been uh, well received. Mary, I can add to that a little bit just from other other program experiences that Energy Hub has experienced. Customers like, you know, based on customer satisfaction surveys we've seen, they like seeing the uh, like the business or in this case, the e-gift card or something physical. What we have found is uh, like for specific questions we've offered on customer surveys is that customers don't notice the bill credit because a lot of customers aren't looking at their bill. So they may not be, you know, realizing that they're receiving their incentive for the program. Yeah, great points. I know that's a challenge for quite a few utilities is clearly being able to describe that on the bills and showcase it to the customer since um, that's, of course, one of the key reasons they want to enroll. We also had a question asking about the smart thermostats and if Ontario is still offering free smart thermostats uh, for the program. Is that still an option for customers? Um, no, the program that offered the smart thermostats, the free smart thermostats, that was called Green On and that ended in 2018. But we do still have some incentive available for smart thermostats in some of our Save on Energy programs. Uh, so they can get a, a reduced, like they can get a, a, an incentive or an instant discount on a smart thermostat in some of our programs. Thanks, Mary. Now moving aside from enrollment and really talking about the success and engagement of the program itself, um, can you share any opt-out rates or any challenges you may have experienced with program attrition? So um, our opt-out rate is about for the events themselves. It runs at about 30%, which is pretty average, um, I understand, across programs that Energy Hub manages. Um, so, um, and that includes people who just um, get uncomfortable in their homes and they, they adjust their thermostats during the course of the event. As long as people are participating in the event for some period of time, we still get some load shed from them. Um, we also find that opt-outs increase with temperature. So the hotter the day is, the, you know, people might opt out sooner. Um, does that answer the question? Oh, attrition rates was the other part of the question, right? So um, Energy Hub monitors our attrition rate for us. Uh, we understand it's, it's pretty low compared compared to, you know, the rate of enrollment. Um, we are trying to take some steps to engage customers more to try to um, minimize that attrition rate. So one of the things we recently implemented was a welcome email. So pretty much, uh, so once you enroll, you get an, e an email that um, identifies all of the features of the program, pretty much everything you wanted to know about Peak Perks, but we're afraid to ask. So that we're hoping will um, help to minimize. The other engagement um, piece that we're working on is kind of a thank you email at the end of the season. So, um, you know, uh, this is how much we collectively achieved together and you personally achieved, uh, you know, X amount of kilowatt hour savings, which is equivalent to 
so many dryer loads or so many hours of running your hair dryer, that kind of a thing. So people can relate to the savings that they're seeing. Thanks for sharing that. Great to hear about that, that low attrition. And coupled with that, you explained pre-cooling early on in the conversation as well. And that um, pre-cooling is sometimes used before events and that can be helpful in keeping customers comfortable during the event, also help reduce any potential opt-outs from an event. Um, can you describe the process on how you determine if pre-cooling should be utilized for an event and what pre-cooling strategy you use for that event? Sure. So um, our pre-cooling is typically only 30 minutes prior to an event starting, and we will adjust the thermostats up um, or sorry, down one degree. So it's not a whole lot. Um, the reason we kind of minimize the pre-cooling is because given our large enrollment base, it makes a huge difference. Like we see that demand climb up on the chart um, with the pre-cooling. Now the caveat to pre-cooling is it may not apply to all thermostats. Eco, and maybe Christina could talk a little bit about this. Pre-cooling on Ecobee thermostats is a little different. Yeah, happy to jump in. Um, so our pre-cooling is based on an algorithm around the home's envelope. So depending on how efficient the home is and what the home needs, a customer will get kind of a, a customized pre-cool based on the comfort of their home. So that is very likely similar to what Mary mentioned, that 30 minutes, one degree is, is the basis for the algorithm. But Again, there are customer homes that are not as efficient. There are newer homes that are more efficient. So our pre-cool is custom to what the that customer is going to need to stay cool for that event while not increasing their cost. So that's another piece of the algorithm. We don't want to have that running for a long period of time up front to increase any costs, especially if they're on you know a TOU rate, which is another piece to the puzzle. Um, so that that's just a, a built-in piece of the Ecobee features as well. So the other one other thing I'll add about pre-cooling is one of our triggers is we will call an event if our control room calls an emergency alert day. We won't employ pre-cooling on those days because we don't want to add to the load that the system is seeing. On regular um, activation days, when the when our threshold is hit or you know when um, the control room identifies that it would be a good day to um, activate an event, we will em employ pre-cooling. Thanks for describing that process to both of you. Um, as this program has, you know, obviously been a success, we've received a few questions in the chat here wanting to learn a little bit more about how you notify customers. Um, so in advance of events, how often, you know, do you notify the customer? What method do you use to notify them? And are they also notified about pre-cooling? So there is an option on uh, Energy Hub's DERMS platform to send a notification to the customers. We choose not to do that uh, for a couple of reasons. One, we really would prefer that the events fly under the radar, that they, you know, participants don't really notice it. And if they're home, if they're not home, they, they may not. Um, but the other reason we don't employ that is because most people set up their notifications in their thermostat app to receive note to receive notifications so the thermostat apps will provide a notification to participants that a, a peak perks event is happening and they're called by different names um, google calls it rush hour you know um, so um, we figured that that is a sufficient notification for the participant but you have to have that notification setting turned on to receive them. I, yeah, and it's, oh, sorry, just to oh, add that a little bit. Yeah. Um, as a best practice for programs where we do see proactive notifications, we do sometimes see like opt-outs before the event starts for maybe, you know, we don't know for every customer why that may occur, but um, it sort of leads to higher opt-out rates uh, by notifying um, if, if you know the utility or the, the customer decides to do that. Yeah, I think thanks for sharing that process. Of course, that notification piece is one that some utilities always work with or test to see what 
the customers prefer if they want to see that on their smart thermostat or have that guidance and be aware if an event is happening. But also perfect reasons um, why not to want to reduce those opt out rates by not fully notifying them of an event. Um, have you conducted any customer surveys throughout the program to share any feedback about what you received in terms of satisfaction, or if you have even received feedback from customers if they would like to actually receive those notifications? So we haven't asked about the notifications, but we do um, we do conduct customer satisfaction surveys on a regular basis. And um, we have received feedback about things like redeeming the MasterCard, you know, there was a bit of a pain point there, um, or um, uh, ease of enrollment. You know, we've received feedback that the uh, participants find it very easy to enroll, so they and enjoy that. So they're done on a regular basis. And as part of the customer satisfaction survey, we also, that was also how we enlisted participants in our evaluation study. So we're conducting an evaluation study on the load reduction uh, of the uh, program. And um, beca again, because we're not the utility, we um, asked for participants to um, uh, be in the evaluation study. And then we sent those people who responded positively a second survey to ask them for their meter, their, their smart meter um, ID number. So we have then um, put those people who are participating in the study in separate groups to um, run a randomized control and treatment group this year. We didn't have that last year, but we're doing that this year to um, confirm our assumptions around the load shed uh, for events. So yeah, customer satisfaction surveys are something that we do on an ongoing basis. Thank you. It Can I just, I was just gonna add that, um, Nest, uh, you know, across North America sees consistently over the years that we we actually see much higher CSAT scores among customers who are participants in demand response programs and, and rush hour rewards programs. It's been consistent over time. Um, and we, the hypothesis is that we think that customers see it as a real benefit of their, their smart thermostat, that they actually think that this is what their smart thermostat should be doing is, is helping in, in programs like this. So just building on what you said, Mary, we, we see a really high CSAT scores for customers that are in programs like this. Thanks for adding that, Vince. In those customer feedback surveys, have you asked about feedback on the incentive? Some of the attendees are curious to better understand how you landed on the $75 and $25 uh, annual incentive for participating. So um, we don't ask specifically if the $75 is a sufficient incentive, but I think it's borne out by the participation in the program. Customers clearly think this is a compelling offer and, uh, you know, to the tune of almost 150,000 participants in Ontario. So $75 is, has been proven to us to be sufficient. And to set that, we did a bit of a jurisdictional scan and some research uh, as part of our program design activities. Uh, it's a $20 annual incentive. It's not $25 and it's paid the same way as the $75, which is a virtual prepaid MasterCard. Um, we are start, we've only paid the annual incentive once because we've only been in market just over a year. So we will be adding that question to future surveys to see if that is sufficient to uh, keep attrition low. Thanks, Mary. And as you continue to look at program data and information, attendees are curious if you've determined a cost benefit analysis for the program. So i.e. doing DR versus procuring peak supply from generation. Is that something you've been thinking about and looking at throughout this process? Yeah, that is something that we keep our eye on. Um, we do have a cost per megawatt hour um, for the program. I don't have it at my fingertips, but the more important um, metric that we pay attention to is our cost effectiveness values. So we monitor both the TRC, the total resource cost and the program administrator cost for the for peak perks. Um, a main point about that is that the program is really not designed to be cost effective in its first year because that $75 incentive is a little bit of a hurdle to, to make that happen. But the longer the programmer is in market, 
the more cost effective it is because the $20 um, annual incentive is, is, you know, better for those ratios. Yeah, that certainly makes sense. And you're right. Of course, the longer duration of the program, the more cost effective you'll see that be. So you're sharing that information. As you prepare for events and take a look at when you're going to call an event, do you provide stakeholders with curtailment forecasts before that event? And if so, what are some of the methods you use to provide those forecasts? I'm sorry, I'm not quite sure what's meant by curtailment forecasts. Yes, yeah, I'm happy to explain that. So I'm um, curious to know uh, if you provide forecasts based on the load shed that you'll receive from calling an event and if you provide that uh, forecast information. In advance. Oh, I see. No, we don't typically predict, try to predict what we're going to see, um, but we do. Um, our assumptions are that we're going to get about 0.9 kilowatts per device. Um, and over the course of the eight events that we've called in 2024, we're seeing about 130 megawatts on average um, load shed with a total load shed of between 150 and 160 megawatts at our current enrollment, uh, which is consistent with the uh, graph that Sanjay showed for our event on June 20th. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for describing that. A few more questions related to enrollment, and this one's specific to the devices. So um, one of the attendees asked, said that you've been able to enroll about 17% of potential customers in the territory. How does that compare for Ecobee compared to Nest, and is that lower or medium or high compared to other service areas where your devices participate in DR programs? So I can say for our program overall, we have about 65% of our devices are Ecobee, and um, which is a little bit different from some other programs that Energy Hub manages, probably because Ecobee is an Ontario-based uh, organization. Uh, about 35% are Google, and the rest are our other eligible devices, which are Alarm.com, Honeywell, and Sensi. So, um, I, I don't know how that compares to other programs, but um, I can pass it off to the other panelists to supplement. Yeah, I can I can start on that and then and pass it to Vince. Um, so in terms of that 17%, I think this sit, sits as a fairly average number for us. I think we, we see higher or lower depending on um, what that starting footprint count is, we call it, how many devices are in a specific zip code or postal code area. Um, what is really unique is to reach 17% in the first year. That is that is a, a huge number. We usually see a much slower growth and we kind of hit that like 15 to 20% in year three or four. Um, so although this is average, the fact that we've hit it within, um, you know, just over a year of this program, um, that's that's a huge number for us. And, and again, we expect that to continue to grow um, to be one of, you know, our higher percentage um, attachment programs likely. Yeah, I would just add there's a ton of headroom to grow, and I think we are still probably early days in engaging all of the Nest users in Ontario, but there's there's a lot of headroom to grow here, and we're excited to, to help could do that. Thanks for describing those percentages and what that looks like for this program and typically across the industry as well. At the end of a season, uh, more and more utilities and networks starting to explore communicating the impact from the participants and what that's led to. Is that something you're providing to participants? Do you give them feedback on how they helped um, in their role in the DR season? Yeah, it's not something we did last year, but we are looking at uh, doing that this year, um, aiming to send something in early October because our season ends at the end of September. And uh, so so the plan is to provide, you know, an overview of the results <clears throat> on a province wide basis, but then try to identify. I mean, we won't be doing it on, on a house per house basis but um, trying to identify the type of, you know, if you participated in all the events, this is how much energy you saved and equate it to 
something that people can uh, uh, understand, like so many hours of using your dryer or so many hours of using your hair dryer or things like that? Yeah, including something relatable so that they can put that person again, put that personal touch and perspective on what that impact was is always really helpful for customers we see making it relatable and communicating that back to them. And I can maybe add to that, Meg. I think um, yeah. our Ecobee customers get like an energy report email. Um, and if they are part of a, a demand response program, we have kind of like what that savings may have looked like tied to um, their home and, and the additional savings they may have got above utilizing some of the other, um, we call them Eco Plus features. So the other algorithms that are part of the Ecobee device that help their home save money. We kind of break that down for them in those um, quarterly energy reports. And, and we do break out, you know, if they supported a DR program, what that might look like as well. So very similar to, to Mary and, and what the group is saying, like giving customers context for what they've done and, and breaking it down to something um, really relatable, uh, we've seen as a huge, uh, a huge benefit and, and definitely helps customers get more connected to new programs and opportunities. Absolutely. Thanks for sharing that. That's great that Ecobee does that and communicates that with customers as well. A few more questions coming through in the, the chat here. I know um, we still have some time, so I'm going to scroll to make sure we we get all of them. You guys are keeping me on my toes here. Um, one uh, question going back to the thermostat adjustment, which I was mentioned in the conversation, but how many degrees per thermostat do you adjust? Um, believe it was two degrees. Um, That's correct. Okay, great. Yeah, two degrees, awesome. Another question following up on that enrollment percentage, um, Ecobee mentioned seeing 17% enrollment um, in year one is unique. What are typical enrollment rates for this type of program in years one and two? Chris? Yeah, absolutely. I think, again, it, it very much varies, but I would say like usually less than 10% in the first year, just depending on the marketing. Again, if you have a, a program with strong marketing like the ISO, I think we did expect to see, um, you know, some really high attachment rates in the first year. But, you know, some programs have more of a soft launch approach and those we see a much lower attach rate. Um, and again, those that kind of come out with a bang and put all their marketing dollars up front, we might see a, a strong attach rate in the first year. So it does vary, but I think, um, that again, varying depending on the marketing um, put into it, but we do see usually closer to like the 10% mark in the first year. Thanks. Yeah, Sanjay, did you have something yeah, to add to that? I, I'd say like, yeah, I agree with Christina that it varies. One of the other factors that we've seen across a variety of programs is the incentive levels that are offered as well um, and sort of so, some of the program parameters. So depending on how many events our call, like the more events, uh, lower incentive, we typically get lower enrollment rates for programs. So I think um, the ISO has done a very good job with the like sort of the, the incentive ratio to the amount of events or the maximum number of events that can be called per summer. Yeah, thank you for adding that full context. You mentioned that, Mary, that of course, at the end of the season here, when you would send out kind of a summary communication in October, have you considered also a winter DR and exploring that option in the future? So we don't have any plans at this time for our winter DR program uh, for two reasons. We are a summer peaking jurisdiction. So those peak, um, the peak load shed is really what we're after. And we are not expecting um, to see winter peaks until at least 2030. Um, so at, at which point we'll become a dual peaking jurisdiction. But the other reason is Ontario is primarily heated by gas. So we probably wouldn't see the results that we see with the air conditioning load in the summer uh, in the with a winter DR program. That makes sense. Thanks for describing that, Mary. Of course, with the summer peaking utility, having that, those programs are gonna be most beneficial. Right, another uh, question here, wanting to understand the success of 
curtailment for the thermostats during an event and what that impact looked like. Referring back to slide 20, so if we could even go a few slides back to the presentation, that might help. Um, but here an attendee would like to understand the spikes that are happening before and after, um, and if that's a snapback occurring during the peak. Angie, I'll let you take that one. Yeah, so the the spike you see before is the pre-cool pre -cool period that occurred before the event, and then there is a slight snapback as the event ends. Um, you can see it's just slightly above the baseline, but not as much as the pre-cool. And you can see as the demand grows from the bottom peak that those are the opt outs. Thanks for walking through this slide again to show that and help us visually recognize it. As you also review information from this season, as the season comes to a close, are there any plans to change some of the program parameters? So, for example, testing different pre-cooling uh, strategies or testing different um, degrees that you change the thermostat to three or four and seeing how that may either impact these results or also impact customer satisfaction. So the Energy Hub Durham's platform has a bit of a tested ground where we can, you know, put in different scenarios and test to see what would happen if we do that so so we're able to kind of predict the results of those different scenarios without actually having to call events like that so that's um, a, a benefit of that energy hub offers to us um, but in terms of the program parameters at this time we have no plans to change the incentive level the number of activations the the activation season we are looking at next year potentially adding more um, load controlled technologies uh, like EV chargers or maybe heat pump water or smart water heaters, that kind of a thing. That's exciting to hear. Certainly see how the program evolves to include more and more in the future. That's great. Believed that summarizes and hits on all of the questions. Um, and yes, a recording of this webinar will be posted. So after Judy, you'll be able to summarize that for us as we begin to wrap things up. So thank you everyone for all of the engaging questions and participating in this discussion. With that, I'll pass it off to Judy to wrap things up for us. Thank you so much, Meg. And thank you again to today's speakers, uh, Mary Bernard, Sanjay Pai, Christina Kelty, and Vince Faherty. We really appreciated your sharing this really great success story. Thank you for an excellent discussion today. So moving on to a couple of last PLMA announcements, as Meg already referenced, we do have our recordings available both um, as podcast recording as well as on our YouTube channel. We'll be getting those up in the next couple of days, so they're available for everyone. If you happen to have had challenges seeing the slides today, please email me, jknight at peakload.org, and I'll be happy to send you the deck. And of course, as I mentioned, this is PLMA's YouTube channel. It's www.youtube.com forward slash at PLMADR, and you can go there to find recordings of all of our load management dialogues and other webinars. And I wanted to also flag for everybody uh, who is looking for more information and more training around demand response and distributed energy resources, as well as uh, demand response wholesale markets. PLMA has two upcoming training classes. These are live online. They are super dynamic and interactive and fun. I guarantee you will learn an awful lot if you're looking for some base, baseline training and more knowledge and information about this topic. Um, you can sign up using our calendar, which is peakload.org uh, forward slash calendar. And last but not least, I want to mention that PLMA's 50th conference is coming up in Brooklyn, New York on the 11th of November to the 13th. It's going to be our biggest and most fun and exciting conference yet, and uh, we can't wait to welcome everybody. So uh, registrations are already super strong, and of course, we've got a hotel block that's uh, going fast. So if you'd like to join us in Brooklyn, please do get signed up soon, and we're looking forward to seeing everybody there. And finally, let me just say thank you again to all of our audience and all of our speakers and let you know that you've been listening to a load management dialogue presented by PLMA. To learn more about upcoming dialogues or for an archive of past recordings, please visit peakload.org or your favorite podcast.
platform. This concludes this edition. Thank you, everybody, and have a good rest of your day.